Welcome in Bob Hallahan, uh, Navy retired. I did about 23 years service in the Navy and the Navy Reserve. Uh, most of the base at Whidbey Island, and most of that was um, was into the Pacific. So I did a lot of tours, a lot of deployments, uh, everywhere from the West Coast all the way to, to the coast of Africa, and that's kind of my, my specialty area. I did a, uh, a tour at the Naval War College in Rhode Island, and that's where I sort of got credentialed in the field of national security. But um, uh, it didn't really change my opinions about climate change. I kind of left the Navy a little bit early, uh, earlier than I, than I really could have, in order to focus um, that work, my energy, my extra energy, uh, in this sphere of public service, which I really think that climate activism is public service, and I think you guys for being here and being part of it. Admiral Truly here uh, was an astronaut and Navy, Navy pilot before that and uh, director uh, of NASA. And he points out something very important that the stresses that climate change will bring as far as national security will be different from any other national security crisis that we've faced. And, and one of the ways, you know, that these, uh, they will be extremely slowly and but they will be sort of grinding and inexorable challenges over the next several decades and they will affect all nations simultaneously. So these are, these are all different from the Cold War or Vietnam or the Revolutionary War, Civil War, any of the challenges that we faced as far as uh, climate, as far as national security go. Uh, I'm gonna roll through a, a bunch of topics today. Uh, here they are, I'll try to pause at the end of every topic for any questions. Can you go and make your slides available? Some of the others. I can email them to you. If you catch me afterwards. Uh, I'm going to go through some general concepts uh, at the beginning, and then uh, a case study on Syria, a uh, second case study on um, migration on our southern border right now, the latest uh, from DC, like what's happening in uh, our nation's capital uh, on this topic, and then some closing thoughts, and an exercise. The exercise is uh, uh, very um, important for us to all be active participants in this, and this is, comes out of a lobby meeting that was with Congressman M. Smith, and he asked me directly, give me the, give me the two-minute version of why, if I'm concerned about national security, I should also be concerned about climate change. And so I'm going to ask you guys to do that, and maybe think of some tips uh, for your own at least one-minute elevator speech on, if I'm concerned about national security, why I should care about the climate as well. Uh, climate, secure, uh, climate change and national security are both life and death topics, <coughs> and we're going to have some of that today. We're not going to shy away from that, uh, but there is some difficult answer here. We're talking about this. Uh, national security is the nominal topic, but American power is easier to talk about. It does seem to be uh, that we're living in a world of self-help, and these seven elements are generally considered by the national security community to be the elements that contribute to national power for any particular country. And I will talk mostly about American power, but all of these concepts apply to any country's national security. My main points today include that uh, American national power will be severely hurt by climate change, in particular through the economic effects, natural resources effects, and the military, but that we can, through adaptation of our national psyche that we can actually um, transcend some of that. This is not challenging imagery. Uh, does anybody recognize this? Yes. Yeah. All right, yeah, 1980 movie. It was a comedy. The gods must be crazy. Uh, for those who didn't see it, the uh, pilot throws a Coke bottle out the window of his airplane and it lands on the Kalahari and this tribe will push them to find it. And they don't know initially what it is, but they soon find lots of uses for it. They've never seen one of these before, but soon they find they can make dough with it, and someone else carries water with it, and someone else uh, starts fire with it, and someone else makes music with it. Pretty soon there's, there's lots of people finding new things to do with it, and there's only one of them, so fights break out. And we had, in the movie, you know, it's a movie, but you had a good example, I think, of scarcity of 
uh, the concept of scarcity and community where a scarce element becomes strongly desired and and then and, and causes conflict within the tribe. This is another example, Andy Borowitz, of thinking of how climate change can cause conflict. <laughs> 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 The first time Point of Vortex really made the news was 2014, and he, he writes brilliantly about it. Uh, in a more serious way, the, uh, the, the concept of climate change involves several discrete things. Right? I'm going to talk about a few of them here in the general concepts. But one of them is, is additional heat. Right? Heat, heat coming in heat waves is going to affect us, and uh, there is uh, some research showing that just being hotter makes you more irritable, makes you crappy. Right? And, and this fellow here points to uh, increased brain temperature, makes you cognitively brain damaged, temporarily at least. And it leads to emotional stress and aggression in the higher levels of violent crime. And those are, those are serious things. Uh, we've seen some anecdotal research. Uh, pitchers in the major league baseball are known or statistically determined to hit the opposing batters more often when it's hot. Oh. And this is, uh, this is a thing, like if a pitcher, if a team gets hit, then the opposing pitcher, when he comes up, he's, you know, he has to like, hey, am I going to hit this guy back? Kind of, kind of, that's kind of thing that happens in baseball. But these, uh, when you're comfortable and irritable, you're just more easily agitated, and that same kind of insult seems bigger. We see it with drivers, too, where in a controlled experiment, when a driver uh, would stop at a red light and then turn green and then he stays there. Well, like the people behind him honk longer when it's hot out than when it's not hot. And in fact, it's worse when the windows are down and presumably you don't have air conditioning. The effect is a lot worse. And so people are people are irritable and they're taking it out of other drivers just because it's hot. Uh, there's another study. There's lots of them. But, uh, there's a police study where even in scenario training, police officers fire more quickly and more often at, uh, at suspects when it's hot out than when it's cold. And this, uh, in this publication here, Crime, Weather, and Climate Change, uh, it was shown that temperature is likely to have a, a strong positive effect on criminal behavior. We now, in the end of the century, climate change is likely to cause an initial 22,000 murders just in the United States, plus millions of other crimes. Wow. And that's just from the heat, by the way. The field of national security and climate change is fairly young. Maybe 15 years of writing and publishing has been done on this. So there's going to be more and more of it. Uh, this was one of the first publications that came out that really hit the streets. Um, it was the Center for Naval Analyses, as I think, in 2007. They, they described what they uh, thought was a gap that could develop between effects of climate change uh, on wealthy countries and the effects on poor countries. And then within that gap will be sort of these resentments that can cause, um, give space to, to Islamic or non-Islamic, uh, to extremist uh, ideologies to create the conditions for terrorism. But we don't want to be in a position where that narrative gets hold and that creates a resentment that's otherwise. Uh, the Center for Naval Analyses updated that report in 2014. And uh, this is the military advisory board of retired general admirals. And they sort of upgraded their, their assessment of the effects that climate change would have on security. And here they're saying that we had always thought uh, uh, that they, uh, climate change will act as a threat multiplier, but now we're saying that it will serve as actually a catalyst for instability and conflict. And these are those two reports. They're both available and both very readable. I, I definitely recommend it. This is uh, another book that came out a few years ago on uh, climate wars, what people would be killed for in the 21st century. And I'm in the middle of that. I don't want to pull a lot of those things that belong to this topic that is out there. It's understood that climate change will accelerate the hydrologic cycle. So there's more, more rainfall, more evaporation. Water is a big question. Everyone wants to know water it, it already has uh, conflicts, wars, armed conflicts, uh, complicated things, and uh, I don't mean to say that any one thing will cause a conflict or a war, but 
almost always in several. Several. So, in this case, uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, and a lot of the surprise that when someone tried to pipe it to Chicago for the World's Fair in 1893, the town people knew the driver. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, this fellow here, here's another book on water wars. So the idea of water wars has kind of taken hold in the community, kind of at the beginning of uh, looking at the <coughs> scarcity the likely to cause conflict in particular with water. Here's an example where a man charged with murder after a long watering dispute. Here in India, uh, rainfall patterns altered by climate change and worsened by inequity has led to water crisis. Here's one. Ethiopian conflict, uh, butterfly growth. Uh, Peter Glick has written quite a bit on the, uh, these water conflicts. He lists uh, many hundreds of them here on the water conflict chronology that is going to be A big takeaway is that these are, so these are documented water conflicts of all varieties, uh, using water as a weapon, water as a way to control it. The historical record, however, this is a little optimism here, uh, not like being optimistic on this topic, but the historical record shows that these often lead to cooperation and motion agreements and treaties uh, more often than a confrontation, but it may change, right? So if you also have a food crisis at the same time as you have a water crisis, then maybe food is more likely to have time. Talking about food, we know that grains like Grass and wheat, uh, or grains like wheat and barley and corn are grains. Are grains. The grasses, the hybridized grasses, you know, from this lawn, the grasses grow a lot better around here right, in the spring and fall when it's cool. Uh, it's something about grasses that they all grow better and uh, they have a little temperature when it gets too hot, even regardless of water, <coughs> they slow down. So heat stress in food is likely to become more. Scenario affecting uh, national security in the future. Ocean acidification is another in part because of food. I'll show you that in a minute, but everyone should be familiar uh, with this basic formula where all the, most of the carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere gets soaked into the ocean and uh, it combines and forms uh, carbonic acid, which is the same thing in your surface. It's your surface water acidity. Well, today's oceans, uh, as a result of this happening, um, are more acidic than they used to be, and the animals that developed in uh, less acidic waters are having trouble already with, uh, with the more acidic oceans that we have. And these are pteropods, and anyone that has uh, the use of calcium in their shells to include oysters, uh, scallops, and mussels, it's pteropods, are uh, already starting to uh, Show sign of dissolving. See if we get it. Make sure this is too much. Well, that's an issue for us because fish eat these, and fish eat them. Well, they're bigger fish, and those little fish are basically fish dissolving. Meanwhile, 75% of people worldwide live within 100 miles of the coast. They live within about a billion people at least now rely primarily on fish as their food source. So when people talk about coral reefs along the way, think about the food going away and think about all of these people. Right? So 15 of the 20 largest urban areas uh, in the world are near a coast. And you know, look at all the people that live here, Manila, Shanghai, Kyoto, there's like 35 million people that live in Tokyo, Tokyo, New York, Seoul, you know, all these are reliant on fish and protein, and therefore on coral reefs and protein, therefore on fish now. Shifting to the Arctic, it's uh, been recognized that it's a region of particular concern in national security. This is the uh, former U.N. Chief of Operations, uh, Chief of Operations, uh, said that the U.S. Navy was woefully unprepared for what we were expecting, which is this. Here's, uh, here's the old Arctic, and here's the new Arctic, right? So, uh, you know, just a representation of the ice in the middle. Well, without the ice, you know, you have the North Coast Passage here. Uh, these are new shipping routes uh, that go from east to west. And the red one here is the direct polar route, which you um, can't do without a slip right now. And these are routes. The consequences are well, here's one. Here's a Russian submersible planting a claim on the seafloor. 
So that this happened off this coast of this island, between the side of these islands and the North Pole, and they're laying claim. So if you have a claim to that land or the resources there, and anybody drives right over it, you, know, you can see how it affects <coughs> Here's a. Uh, that, that land mass that <coughs> is that green? Is that green? Yeah, here in the green field. Here's uh, Exxon Valdez, 30 years later. We're still debating whether to clean it up, whether to finish cleaning it up. It's not, yeah, those rocks right there. It's not real. Really this was, uh, remember this Italian cruise ship hit a uh, rock in an area that had been navigated for thousands of years. This was the Achille Loro incident, which <coughs> the ship was hijacked, and an American in a wheelchair was pushed off the outside from that. It was in the 80s. This is the Mercy, Alabama. Another where pirates attacked the Mercy, Alabama, Captain Phillips, Navy Seals, there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, this. Imagine that any of this stuff happening in the Arctic. Uh, this is, you know, this happened in the Gulf of Mexico where there's lots of resources to fight this. What is this? The, 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 the deep water rise in 2020. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Shifting again, this is uh, Pacific Island, or Indian Ocean Island. Think about uh, this, is, the land is probably either coral or volcanic, or maybe even limestone, and it, uh, there's porous, and, and so water that falls as rain will uh, soak through it and become sort of a freshwater lens, even though this, ocean, this island may be surrounded by thousands of miles of seawater, there's going to be fresh water on top of it. If you dig a well, you'll draw down the lead a little bit, and there will be some mixing here at the border between salt water and fresh water, but basically this is how people who live on these islands survive, is the fresh water land. So sea level rise is what I'm talking about here. As sea level is expected to come up, this fresh water is gonna come up as well because it's lighter, it floats on top of the salt water. And you can see that after a fairly short order, uh, the island's gonna become unlivable as the fresh water lens gets thinner and thinner. Uh, it'll be harder and harder to live. In 2015, uh, some research came out that, uh, that sort of changed the way we think about this particular problem. He said, uh, this guy in uh, Nature Magazine, sea level rise will result in larger waves and higher wave-driven water levels along atolls shorelines than at present. And the waves will synergistically interact with the sea level rise, causing twice as much land forecast to be flooded for a given value of sea level rise than we thought. And that looks like this. So here's the, so you know, the reef, the old reef has built its way out here, and, and there's some water above it, and you have some wave height as a result, and then uh, and you have freshwater lands and there people. And as the water comes up, the wave height is also going to come up. Not just because of stronger storms, but just because the pitch is going to increase. So the depth here, the height of this is related to the depth of that. And if the reef doesn't grow as fast as water comes up, uh, you're likely to suffer some overwash, and, and uh, the consequences will, will be severe for the freshwater lands that those people rely on. And which, which people are we talking about here? Marshall Islands is a United States protectorate. It's over uh, here, you know, North Australia, and South Japan. You know, there's hundreds of islands here, 53,000 people. The average elevation is almost 7 feet. This is the capital of the Maldives in the Indian Ocean. And the runway's out here capital city there. Now that obviously relies on desalinated water, but you can see the point. There's 400,000 people here. The average elevation of their land mass is five feet. So uh, consequences of a little bit of sea level rise combined with a higher wave action. Uh, we don't really have to think about it. And these people have. You've heard Pure Boss, a small nation has been making a lot, of, a lot of noise about climate change for decades and hope that we're all listening, but they, they ended up buying some land in Fiji. Like, hey, we're going to move our whole nation to another island. But, <coughs> yeah, they came up with $8 million, $8.5 million to buy some land there. So, wow. luckily, Kiribati is a small, uh, small place. They tried to buy in India, I think, but they ended up in Fiji. But these are difficult questions, right? Is this country going to still exist once they move? You know, that may happen during our lifetimes that they start to migrate over. Probably will. Will they have fishing rights? Will they will they be legal migrants? These things all have to be things that we adapt to and start to think about. Questions on those kind of general concepts? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
no fun image, right? <laughs> this rolled across your desk probably in uh, September of 2012. Uh, this, is, this is Alan Curdy, two-year-old boy. He was a Syrian refugee. And he, he's the face of uh, Syrian refugees. He became that in one day. He, he died in an overnight crossing of, uh, you know, along with his uh, older brother and his mother and two other family members. And uh, this is part of the tide of immigrants that left Syria, many of whom went through Turkey and then tried to get to Greece. And many thousand did successfully, but some did not, and they died in all the boats. Uh, these Greek islands, um, they were, you know, here they were mostly unguarded, you know, and boatloads of refugees, you know, thousands a day sometimes were coming ashore on these Greek islands. And, Seeing that, uh, and that had been happening for some time because the war started early, many years, you know, a few years earlier. And, uh, and then when uh, Alan Kirby's picture came to our national consciousness, international consciousness, it really uh, got everyone's attention. He, uh, he had some effects I'll talk about in a little bit. But what I want to talk about is the Syria, is Syria's the, really the first, the second, it's the second war where we have good examples of documentation between climate change, between the drought, between conflict that resulted. And Darfur was the first, but I had better data on Syria, so I'm going to share that with you. It, again, it, it's various long-standing disputes were part of it. It's not just climate change caused the war. You can't really see that. But you can say that climate change made the drought worse, and that led to water scarcity, and all of that led to conflict. And this is what, it, that, what that looked like. Here's Syria. You've got the Mediterranean Sea basically over here, and Turkey up here, and Iraq over here. And you have the Euphrates River, kind of their main water source, plus rain and water in the mountains. And you have farming regions. And Syria had traditionally been water scarce, but also self sufficient. And at some point, they did actually export grain. They were able to do that, and they were proud of that. In 1950, they had a population of about 3 million, which was basically how many people lived in North America in 1770. Uh, and then they went to 22 million by 2012. So large uh, growth in population. And amidst that, the, the country to the north, Turkey, began damming the Euphrates, and that dropped the water level. So here's, here's a water level that is available to Turkey, in part due to um, the dams that were in Turkey. And then they had... Um, climate change. So the, the country, since 1900 to, two, to 2005, there were five documented droughts, um, six documented droughts, five of them lasted one season, and one went two seasons. And then in 07, the spring of 07, there was just no rain. So they started a, a, long, a long drought. And Gary Nabon called this the worst long-term drought and most severe set of crop failures since agricultural civilizations began in the Fertile Crescent many when they had to grow. Pretty severe. The context was water mismanagement as well. So that government, this, the government mismanaged the water that they had. So again, I'm not saying that climate change causes conflict, but these two elements certainly played off each other. Where you had, uh, this is, the number, the percent of farmers that were flooding their fields to irrigate their crops, 83%, very wasteful type of uh, irrigation. And here your sprinkler, and here your drip irrigation, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were governing well, you would have pushed everybody towards drip irrigation if you were a country that was water scarce, but they didn't do that. As a result, they had livestock deaths up to 85%, and, and even higher in the, the kind of the north, uh, northeast. <coughs> North, northeast area. Uh, barley went down by two thirds, wheat dropped by 47%. What that looks like to a person is this. Uh, this was the New York Times expose on a farmer who in 2010 had previously had 400 acres of wheat and now he's got desert, right? He's got nothing. Climate change has had a role in this. NOAA reported a dramatic drop that was decades long, half of which they attributed to climate change. In particular, it was more dry days during the rainy season, higher, higher eastern Mediterranean uh, surface temperatures. And what that did, 
higher temperatures in this region right here would uh, sort of cause a higher pressure region, which would push the moisture that they expected up into Turkey. Instead of going through Syria, um, a little bit of extra pressure here would generally push the radius itself farther north. And that's how that kind of played out in their case. It was considered much too great to be explained by natural variability alone, according to the research. The conflict itself, uh, by 2011, there were lots of these farmers, uh, over a million were in food insecurity, a million and a half moved to camps near cities, which are the not comfortable places to live, right? So it's going to be kind of boredom, underemployment, and unrest. And by 2008, the Syrian agricultural minister, this was only two years into the drought, I said that the economic fallout from the droughts beyond our country, but beyond our capacity as a country to deal with. There's evidence that the, the unrest began in areas where there was high displacement, and the Syrian government response was just monstrous, and it was brutal, and, and it was totally disproportionate to the types of uh, unrest that they had. And fights did occur during the war over big assets like dams, and, and are still, of course, the worst that ran, and secondary assets as well. And Syria could have done better, right? They should have. Better water management practices with crop selection. We talked about the type of irrigation. Aquifer care, caring for the aquifer, restricting pull-outs would have helped. More international water sharing agreements, like with Turkey, say, hey, let's come on. You know, we're having a drought here. Help us out here. And maybe even more dams on the Euphrates. So they could have done some things. In the short term, uh, Ali Kurdi's photo really uh, opened the world's hearts toward these people. Sweden uh, started allowing lots more people in. The, uh, the UK said, hey, we're going to take 20,000 over five years. Uh, even President Obama said, hey, we're going to open 10,000 a year, and they welcome here. The uh, Balkan countries opened a corridor for migration to go through uh, their place instead of keeping on the border. But predictably, there was a backlash, right? And uh, what that looked like uh, just a few years later, uh, the far right AFD party in Germany began winning seats, and they were an anti-immigrant and nationalist party. And they hear the same thing happened in, in uh, the Dutch, and the same thing happened with the French. So Marie Le Pen, or Marie Le Pen almost, almost won the presidency. Um, the British had Brexit. Yeah. I think that's related. And uh, we had our own little nationalist uh, anti-immigrant person we elected to. So I think that you know, I'm drawing lines between the migrant crisis and uh, the right-wing resurgence of power in Europe and the United States. And um, that's tentative and not super strong, but I think it's part of the thing that national security people draw lines between this part of us. The questions on the serious stuff? So when, oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, <coughs> even more than just a, this kind of conflict, though, there will always, there's going to be, as more land is being flooded, et cetera, um, climate migrants that are going to be pushing in and dominating the culture that they're pushing into, I think, even not Yes, absolutely. And yeah, you'll see it in my next class. Texans will be coming up to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll talk about it here because uh, yeah. <laughs> our next, our next case study is, is what's happening on our border right now. Well, refugees are not, climate refugees are not currently a legal entity. Right? The, the UN convention that governs what a refugee is talks about war, escaping war and conflict and violence. And that's like, like, it does not talk about, hey, I, I have no fresh water because the sea came up. You know? So uh, when we talk about responding to climate, you know, we're going to move our buildings away from the ocean. We're going to maybe change our crops. We're going to share water better. But we're also going to do things like we talked about before. We're going to change uh, internally how we deal with the grief here. And we're going to maybe look at our laws uh, and maybe give recognition to chronic refugees as I go forward. This is, uh, you know, when I was a child, I remember my church uh, hosted a refugee family from Vietnam. This is the USS Ranger aircraft carrier rescuing 138 Vietnamese people. It was a common thing. Our, in response to the Vietnam refugees situation, our country changed a lot of laws. Uh, but, you know, this is a different time. And, uh, you know, our country has 
has a different feeling about it right now. And it's important that we not like dismiss that um, because a big portion of our country really uh, really has a very limited, not very, but really has, let me, let me start over. All countries, I think, have a limited generosity for this situation. And that climate adaptation, we're going to have to address this. There's going to be a lot more migrants. And uh, absorbing them is kind of an open question at this point. We see on the border right now, this is just from uh, a couple weeks ago, we have an increasing number of migrants and a changing type of people, like not type, but changing demographics of people. Like a lot of these people were single people from Mexico who came and would work and maybe go back and you know, they get caught and they get sent back to Mexico. But here, what we have, uh, what's going on now is, is families and not really from Mexico, but from Central American countries. And that's these three countries here, these, here uh, the, the triangle countries. This is Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, the three primary we're talking about. And I don't mean to leave Nicaragua out, but uh, most of the most of the current situation on our southern border right now is, is these is people from uh, these three countries. This is uh, the next few slides are World Food Program slides that uh, that I'm going to kind of still their their study of the last decade, uh, like what's going on with these three countries and how it's affecting our national security. <coughs> uh, here you have kind of the dry corridor, and these dark areas are places where the World Food Program interviewed people who were refugees, who became refugees, and where they came from. So they they basically had uh, these, agri these were agricultural regions, even though it's dry. These are some of these are agricultural areas. And guess what? Climate change is the story behind the headlines here. Uh, to some extent, climate change is. is causing the migration that we're having. And what it looks like, this was a November article in the Washington Post, rows of corn plants dotted the landscape, yet when you look close, they were mostly dead inside, like not much corn in the, in the corn. <coughs> Across Honduras, an unpredictable climate has made the situation increasingly common. Droughts have wrecked crops, changing weather patterns have created additional challenges for millions of farmers. And what they mean by additional challenges there is uh, coffee rust. There's a new fungus affecting coffee plants, and it's likely to spread throughout Africa and Central America and make coffee plants. Uh, those are big money plants for these farmers. <coughs> the neighboring country, Guatemala, had a nice article. This was August, April. This was two, two weeks ago in the New Yorker. About six years ago, that things started to change. This farmer said residents depended on the few crops that could survive at an elevation of more than 9,000 feet. They would harvest maize and sell potatoes, but uh, climate change is wiping out the region's crops. In the higher parts of town, there have been more frosts than there used to be. They kill an entire harvest in one fell sweep. In the lower part of Clementoro, there's been much less rain and new sorts of pests. Farmers have been abandoning their land. The survey of people, <coughs> why they were immigrating, uh, here, the red houses are no food. The orange houses are no money. And uh, or yellow houses are no food, or no question of job. So the vast majority is about food, money, and stuff. And then there's a little bit of violence. So El Centro has some gang activity, MS-13, mostly El Centro. But in this particular study, it was not a major factor. Most of the migrants were related to no food, no money, no job. And we have data showing a decline in precipitation led to an increase in arrests from, these are Mexican authorities, so not conclusive data, but here, interesting information. That, um, this is the beginning of the drought, and migrants start ramping up. Migration is sort of a thing where there's a push and a pull, right? So depending on where you want to go, you might get pulled there, but generally people don't want to migrate, right? They, they live somewhere. Something pushes them out. And these kind of shocks are what affects the people. And, they, and this is kind of what they do. I'm sorry, you can't read that. But uh, initially, people who are in dire straits tend to uh, reduce consumption and readjust their finances. And so these, you would say, these are resilience neutral. And, and then you start, when it gets worse, you start selling maybe a car, or maybe you sell jewelry, or 
like the momentum room or something, and then you take on some debt, and you're starting to lose your resilience and your ability to stay at this place. And then if it keeps getting worse, you might sell your goats or your sheep or your land or cows, and then the kind of last thing you would do is, is migrate. Thank you, do we have a sense of how much the migration to the southern border is um, the effects of climate change you're talking about versus um, leftover effects from the wars of the 80s? I don't think the wars of the 80s affect much. Um, the wars of the 80s, those effects maybe are on in kind of a weak government, I think. Uh, not my area of expertise, really, but I think that uh, you know, a lot of these countries have some, and, uh, all countries, right? They have some endemic corruption, some government efficiencies, some waste. Um, I think uh, the real the wars that they have then definitely are still some of those <coughs> some of those effects are lingering. So it's pretty uh, uh, oppressive governments at the time. Is that oppression still uh, oppressive governments um, um, that kind of behavior still existing? I don't want to say yes or no to that. Not really. Not my area. So I'm wondering if also that small section of uh, fleeing violence, though, potentially those are also maybe some um, underlying causes of less um, resources and things which then tend to try to get it may be more complex and not in silos like that. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, no, no question. Uh, those were kind of the primary primary responses to, to how they responded. But yes, it's definitely complex. Yeah. Um, the takeaway for you guys is when you talk to people about climate change, say, hey, migration is going to affect our national security. It's definitely going to. Migration is partly caused by climate change. It's going to make it all right, CCL, who's, uh, who's here from CCL? So most, okay. Uh, CCLers should definitely know who these people are. Uh, Adam Smith, Congressman from local area, right? And he's the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. And uh, Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma is chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. These people couldn't be more different on the climate. Yeah. Um, I've been in lobby meetings with uh, this congressman here. And he, like, he, he asked me point blank, right, what's, what's your, make your, make your case. So he's open to hearing that climate and the military are related. I'm not so sure about the other fellow that's working progress for the Oklahoma folks. But interestingly, the executive <coughs> branch is required every four years to report on the state of the climate and how it's affecting the United States. Now the Trump administration did so. They released this last November on Black, Black Friday. Right? They tried to bury it in a slow news day, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, even more interestingly, they didn't reach into the report to change the conclusion <coughs> like the Bush administration did. Uh, this White House released it the way, it, the, way the bureaucrats wrote it. How can right. you account for that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's an oversight. Yeah, well, it, it may be, but they, uh, they concluded, the bureaucrats who wrote this, the scientists and the committee of people, that climate change is already affecting the United States Department of Defense assets by, among other things, damaging roadways, runways, and waterfront infrastructure. That's a pretty strong statement. Here's another one. Development assistance that we give to other countries helps save lives. It reduces poverty. It strengthens democratic governance. And um, it reduces suffering. Climate impacts threaten to undermine U.S. investments. And they may necessitate additional humanitarian assistance and some military assistance or even intervention in response to more frequent severe natural disasters. So if you want to say the Trump administration has come out formally in favor of climate action for national security benefit, you'll be on strong ground. And in January, so two months later, the national intelligence community came together for this worldwide threat assessment, and it's 42 pages long, and had a whole page about environment and climate change. And they had some pretty strong things to say about it. Again, this is our National Intelligence Services it's a, uh, general opinion that uh, climate change is likely to fuel competition for resources, economic distress, social discontent. Uh, in future years, there's irreversible damage, ecosystems, habitats, 
undermining the economic benefits they provide. We talk about extreme weather in here. Uh, urban coastal areas in the Western Hemisphere will definitely be affected. Damage to communication, transportation infrastructure, low-lying military bases are affected. Economic costs, human displacement, loss of life. And we'll talk about heat waves, droughts, floods, uh, social unrest, migration, here it is, interstate tension in countries such as the Middle East areas. And then we'll talk about the Arctic. So some pretty strong uh, stuff here. Um, DOD infrastructure, remember that these three major bases in Florida really impacted. Homestead gone um, from a hurricane years ago, Andrew. Pensacola was shut down for a year, and uh, Tyndall is in uh, match six right now. Even. This is Norfolk Naval Station, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> flooding that affected those cars and this parking lot. So the commander of that station, largest naval base in the world, um, said that it's not just a nuisance problem, right? This is not a minor operational issue. Sea level rise was interfering with combat readiness for the Atlantic fleet. And think about that. Like these, these are people's cars. Sailors who probably don't make much money. They're off on deployment. They park in some lot and they come back and their car's not in, right? Now they have bills and now their car's totaled, they're squeaky. And they have to deal with that in addition to their regular how they're going to get to work questions, right? So that's, these are kind of operational impacts from, uh, from flooding. Here's another case of a very important uh, strategic asset, this Diego <coughs> Garcia, that is uh, a small atoll in the early Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it's owned by the British, but we use it a lot. Here's another one, the Pacific Missile Tracking Site in Kwajalein Atoll, part of the Marshall Islands. And um, could be unusable in 20 years, right? So when uh, the United States tests the missiles from Vandenberg, they launch a lot, and they get radar tracked from this site here. Right, so billions have been spent on this facility, and within 20 years, we might not be able to use it anymore because of those things we talked about before. And the Department of Defense released a report in January about how climate change is likely to affect the infrastructure that we use. Should be at the top of everybody's concern list, right? Really? 79 operational military installations, 74 are threatened by the effects of climate change just over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Just just during our lifetimes, 74. Wow. They included uh, recurrent droughts, flying from across wildfires, fire threats. Well, the White House took notice of these things. <laughs> You've probably heard about this, the White House Red Team. This was a uh, a uh, discussion paper for the deputies committee below, so one level below the National Security Council, where the purpose of this meeting was to seek, uh, was to seek recommendations on signing an executive order. <coughs> and what they said is basically they want to establish a, a committee to evaluate these reports, this three that I just talked about. Uh, evaluate the evaluators. Right? Yeah, right. So he said these scientific and national security judgments have not undergone rigorous independent adversarial, sci adversarial oh. scientific peer review to examine the certainty is uncertainty in climate sciences, as well as in the case of science. That's what, so. This was roundly criticized, deservedly so. I don't know if it's been signed out. I don't know if this is happening yet. But the idea was to put my McNair in charge of this. So national security is not just a military job. Uh, we'll think about diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, kind of the four levers of, of national power. And military and this is so think about the um, State Department does this, the Defense Department does this, Treasury does this, and informational is things like our culture. Um, you can think of our movies, our, our songs, and we American songs transmits goes throughout the world. And my challenge for you in part is to use these powers, you know, if not uniform, you have to use military power, but you can certainly uh, participate in our informational uh, tools of national power. Uh, uh, questions on uh, the latest on DC? All right. I'd say this may be more of a general question. So I've read a lot of uh, stuff from the DOD about climate change. And one of the things I haven't ever seen is uh, any comment about the anthropogenic nature of climate change, and so could you comment on why there's never any comment on that? He doesn't care why it's happening. He 
DOD is uh, concerned with that it's happening. There. And so yeah. why is that? I mean, typically, typically the DOD would be concerned why there's going to be a war. Well, the DOD has done some things on the edges of that question. The so Secretary Ray Mabus, former Secretary of Navy under Obama for eight years, uh, did quite a bit of work reducing the Navy's reliance on petroleum and had the Great Green Fleet and a lot of initiatives um, towards reducing the Navy's use of that. But the DOD itself is a huge user of petroleum, admittedly so, so you'd think that they would come out for energy efficiency. And they have for tactical reasons. Like a base that relies on solar power is a lot more safe than a base that, that relies on the grid the local. And the con fuel convoys going to Iraq and Afghanistan were attacked routinely. And so if you can do fewer fuel convoys, then you can save lives, right? Save lives with your own people. So some of that is happening, but it's sort of not <coughs> spoken about. Uh, as an aside, could you, could you uh, uh, say something about how the, the Navy reduces uh, petroleum usage? Yeah, yeah. well, the Navy's buying hybrid ships. There's a class of ships and that carry uh, amphibious, you know, the amphibious ships that carry Army or Marine soldiers. The, uh, the can you speak the up a little bit? I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah, the Navy's been able to purchase some hybrid ships that can shut down the main engines and still steer based on batteries. And they save hundreds of thousands of gallons um, every time they're used. The Navy has certainly moved toward nuclear power as a way of um, minimizing fossil fuels. Uh, Army has done a lot of research into purifying water, purifying wastewater, making it into drink water. So, like Iraq is a great example. There's like water everywhere in Baghdad, but if it's not drinkable, then you have to bring it in, right? So then you have planes or convoys of just drinking water when you, when you could just draw from the Euphrates and Tigris right there, purify it. So that kind of resiliency is done, and that's sort of a type of tactical lesson as well. Implications of all this, I'm drawing here from some work by these guys I want to credit, David Michael and Amit uh, Pandya, I've never met them, but they, they wrote this great paper that talks about some of the, the uh, unequal impacts or uh, questions of what you might call justice applied to national security and that for us and for maybe Britain and France like the climate change is a question of stability and adapting but for developed nations like Kiribati and Fiji and Marshall Islands these are literally their national survival at stake and it's imposed upon them from the developed world so that unequal impact again you don't want you don't want a narrative to develop there that uh, the United States is to be blamed for the removal from the face of the earth in these countries. There are some unconventional risks that are worth thinking about uh, at another time. And, and first is that they can provide governments an excuse to blame problems on externalities instead of adapting. So think about Syria. Um, instead of adapting to the drought that they had, they blame the problems maybe on the rebels. At the beginning. They could also reduce the willingness to cooperate just when it is needed most such as closing the border, or turning off aid, or hoarding supplies. And if, this was written years ago, right? A few years ago. And here it's happening. It's really happening, right? With the Trump administration cutting off aid to those tribal countries just when it's most important that they uh, have to help them adapt. Countries may also see greenhouse vulnerable neighbors as sources of instability and candidates for military invention, intervention instead of disaster aid. And you can think about that happening right now with India and Bangladesh. Certainly, India's built a giant fence between India and Bangladesh. As water comes up, Bangladesh is going to be one of the first affected. All the tigers that live in the uplands are going to be. 9-11. Um, Very good reading, this uh, commission report, 9-11 executive summary. The takeaway here is, uh, I think encapsulated in this quote, the most important failure uh, regarding 9-11 that happened and that the events that led up to it um, were things that we could foresee happening. It was a failure of imagination. We do not believe that leaders understood the gravity of the threat. The terrorist danger from Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda was not a major topic for policy debate among the public, or the media, 
in the Congress. It barely came up during the 2000 presidential campaign. So how many questions on climate change came up during the 2016 presidential campaign? <laughs> so I draw a parallel between Pearl Harbor, between this event here, and what's happening with climate change. It's really, really terrible. Like, but we had lots of warning, like the summer of, to that, going back to 1998, Bin Laden, you know, he called for a fatwa to kill all Americans anywhere <coughs> in the uh, He attacked the coal, he attacked the embassy bombings, he attacked, you know, lots and lots of events led up to 9-11 attack and our intelligence picked up on all of those things, but they didn't connect the dots. And even though uh, CIA Director George Tenet told this committee that the system was blinking red, that's what he, that's what he said, the system, <coughs> the system was blinking red in the summer before 9-11. Wow. So our challenge is more than just getting the carbon out because we've been talking about this for a while. Here, this came up last week, I thought it was beautiful. Right? This guy here, Gus I have no idea who he is, but he said, I, used to, I, think, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Well, I don't know if Dalai Lama said this or not, but here's a picture of the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and a nice quote. It says, the planet does not need more successful people. The planet desperately needs more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of all kinds. So our challenge is not just to get the carbon out. I mean, that would be not, that, that's essentially the goal, but this has to happen first. It seems, like, it seems like we have to come to a national consensus about doing something, and then we have to do all of it. Um, so that's really... Okay. What our challenge is today. Um, uh, so the the coke bottle caused a great deal of strife in in the uh, in the tribe. So a formerly peaceful tribe, uh, people like the coke bottle, but everybody wanted it, and, and only one kind of person could have it. But the cost of a fight, the tribe eventually sent the tribal leader to throw the coke bottle off the end of the earth, which is what's happening here. Uh, I think that's a good analogy for fossil fuels, right? So if we could just, like, it's really useful, but we found out that there's bad things associated with that, so we need to get rid of it. Um, let's hope we can. Uh, anyway, I just Thank thought you. that was good. Really? Yeah. I see we have about 10 minutes left. Any questions? Is the intelligence community looking at other countries from the point of view of their instability of climate Yes, yes. There's a lot of work on this in those uh, National, uh, Center for Naval Analysis studies, uh, Google CNA.org, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so 400 million people in India live on the rivers of the Brahmaputra and the Ganges. Like that's more than, that's how many live in North America, on just these two rivers. And Brahmaputra and the Ganges are Rivers that originate in the Himalayas, the Himalaya glaciers are melting faster yes. than anywhere. And so what's likely to come out of that, according to the CIA, is that uh, those rivers are gonna initially flow more rapidly than historically they have, and then they're gonna dry up where they're gonna be very small. So those, kind of, those people, those 400 million people are gonna have to deal with too much flow, and then a couple generations later, hardly any. So yes, they're looking at all the regions. Um, so uh, have they done anything looking at um, increase in pathogens and uh, as a consequence disease and stuff that's increasing due to warmer cl um, climate because they mm -hmm. tend to do better under warmer climate? Have they looked at the, the increases in disease which then destabilizes more? Yes, I want to say yes. I don't have good like stories about that. Okay. Um, we know the Zika is transmitted by a mosquito. That the range of that mosquito is expanded by climate change, chikungunya, lots of diseases. Um, uh, I don't have. They know the military has those hospital ships, you know, the Comfort and the Mercy, yeah. and uh, we sent one of those to uh, Bangla Aceh after the Indonesian uh, earthquake tsunami. There really should be more of that, I think. It helps our national security when we do that kind of thing. Hi. 
Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask, how do you think, as someone who's like in CCL and for others as well, and someone who has been in the Navy, ways to like talk about national security that don't increase like xenophobia, <coughs> that increase like hyper nationalism, whereas like we don't want immigrants because I think when people think national security, you know, being threatened, they like tense up, and that can lead to a lot of like racism, which we're already seeing. How do you think you can talk about that in a way that's like anti-racist? Um, and like pro-immigrant in a way that's welcoming to refugees. Yeah, I think uh, that's super important, and uh, John Tenbe had a talk kind of about that this morning. But first is to recognize that I think that the world's generosity towards uh, people coming in from outside is limited. It's a, it's a human thing. It's not an American thing. So kind of kind of respect that um, that every society kind of has a limit to what to what can be really uh, their willingness to, uh, to go forward with that. So uh, address increasing that generosity through various whatever artistic ways. We really need an acclimate, a climate acclimate, I think. But um, <laughs> I think you have to recognize first that it's natural. It's happened lots of times in our history and in Europe right now, too, and uh, in India. There's lots of places that recognize we just have kind of limited number of the tolerance for, for migration. That's, yeah, push back, go ahead. I think as far as like, we have a limited generosity, we've also like done really horrible things as a nation. And as far as like talking about like the 90 corporations or whatever, a lot of those are, you know, US based or in the Western world in general. And so as far as like, generosity like limits and like responsibility, I see those as two totally different things. Um, because we don't, I don't think that we have any more like right to our safety that we've like manufactured over you know history of colonialism than other people do who are fleeing the impacts of that colonialism over time. Well, there's a lot of people disagree with that, but, but I want you to right. make I want you to make the argument and go forth. Um, I think we have you know there were, Syria produced about five million refugees, and you saw the effects on Europe. But by 2050, the kind of number that's floating around is there might be 200 million climate refugees, 200 million instead of five. So we're definitely going to have to deal with that. And so I hope that your perspective takes wider view. Yeah. Have you heard any discussions about what to do with the climate refugees? I mean, we have one solution now, which is walls. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what's being discussed about you know what sounds like the inevitable, which is people moving north. This is where I kind of uh, our soft power um, spreading generosity. Uh, that's really it's needed. It's more generosity in your life, all this kind of stuff. Uh, really, those people are going to come, and uh, we have to decide: are we going to fight that? Are we gonna... I should say that open borders are not part of the world we live in. Officially, since the, since the definition of a state in like uh, 14, Treaty of Westphalia, 1473, I think, established the states are allowed to determine who comes in and who comes in into the country. Uh, we kind of have to accept that, that we live in a world of states and a world of self help. And, uh, that'll go the answer to, to all the migrants that we're going to get. This is learning for both of us. Part of the answer is to get people to wake up to you know what's happening versus you know the gut response of you know it's at your door now you have to deal with it if yeah, you know if you can get enough people to think ahead and help people in place and you know you kind of have suggested that and whatever and be prepared and whatnot it's going to be bad but at least if you're Preparing ahead, there's more of a chance of less chaos. Yeah, well, I hope so. Well, let's do this exercise. Does anyone want to take a chance at this? Take a stab at this. Uh, give us your uh, one minute version of why, if you're a patriot, you should really be a climate activist as well. Sure. It seems to me that if we are really concerned about national security and survival as a nation, we've got to recognize that that solution is going to come from cooperation because 
the world is so interdependent in ways that it never was, you know, throughout history. You know, you could have a nation that just kind of existed in isolation. It doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist for our companies, it doesn't exist for our economies, or anything. So if we really want to survive, we have to work together and solve whatever problem we face so that the earth can survive. Yeah. So you kind of make an argument for sustainability. You kind of make an argument for maybe the United Nations or for international agreements, uh, exactly. bilateral or otherwise. Um, yeah, work country working together to solve mutual problems. That's very valid. Anyone else want to make that? Give the give the elevator speech. Well, I and I I'm not really giving a speech, but I'm I'm thinking that there really needs to be a global, in, you know, international. Uh, policy uh, agreement or, or something like that. But the United States, being a world, you know, a nation of have, they're going to be reluctant to. People don't want to give up anything that they have, and I, you know, I think the hard reality of it is we need to face that we're going to have to do that, and we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way with wars and and that sort of thing. But really, we're we're relinquishing some of our children's and grandchildren's resources as well. And that's what it's all about, the resources. Yeah. I read a book maybe two decades ago that changed my life. It's called How to Want What You Have by a guy named Tim Miller. And he, he talks uh, kind of in very specific terms about <coughs> being generous just by realizing how much you already have. Like, think about if you were lived in the Middle Ages, you, you had to be like a king to, to hear music, but we can turn on the radio or TV 24 hours a day and listen to any kind of music we want. Like, we have clean water, just everywhere. We can just drink it for free, just about. We have uh, warmth. You know, these small things are everywhere in, 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 in our society, and appreciating those, the little things that we have that so many, like you know, some of the richest people that have ever lived on the, on the face of the earth, and I think to get into your question, and yours, you know, that generosity um, will spring from realization that um, we're already extremely wealthy as we are, and hopefully that willingness to share uh, will make us all more Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming today.